Joe Biden and Russian President Vladimir Putin met yesterday in Geneva for their first sit down since Joe took office. And after years of Democrats attacking President Trump for allegedly going too easy on Russia, Joe Biden really let Putin have a piece of his mind. Yeah, that's right. No more Mr. Nice Guy. Joe had a clear message for Putin. If you're going to attack our critical infrastructure, you better make sure you only attack some of it. Another area we spent a great deal of time on was cyber and cybersecurity. I talked about the proposition that certain critical infrastructure should be off limits to attack, period, by cyber or any other means. I gave them a list. If I'm not mistaken, I don't have it in front of me, 16 specific entities, 16 defined as critical infrastructure under U.S. policy. Yeah, number 17, you can blow that thing to smithereens, but those 16, no way. Joe actually went harder at a CNN reporter during this trip than he did at Putin. Because according to our prevailing culture, the U.S. Congress, the social media, Victoria's Secret, it's Victoria's Secret, the real threats we face don't come from our adversaries abroad. They come from racism, sexism, and fat phobia. I'm Michael Knowles. This is The Michael Knowles Show. Welcome back to the show. My favorite comment yesterday from Trucker Pete, who says, give nothing to the left. It'll never be enough. Very important message. It seems simple, but somehow people don't get it. This, this has to do with Juneteenth. This has to do with Marjorie Taylor Greene. This has to do with an eternal political maxim. Do not give anything to the left. They will not give you credit. They will take more and more and more. And that leads to social chaos, leads to economic craziness. And when that happens, you're going to want to make sure you have acre gold. So you know that the price of gold has been all over the place lately. Now there is a new way to buy gold through a company called Acre. Acre lets you subscribe to gold bars for as little as $30 a month. Michael, you liar. You're, you're probably thinking that right. Michael, you liar. Gold bars cost more than $30. I know. Can you hear me out, please? Thank you. Acre has figured out this ingenious method whereby you pay $30 a month. When your gold stash reaches the price of their gold bars, they will discreetly ship Acre Gold to your house. Just recently, Acre has introduced a new $100 a month subscription to a 5-gram gold bar. Acre lets you invest in physical gold without coming out of pocket all at once, keeps you updated on your gold stash every month, and then you will discreetly get that Acre Gold shipped to your door. It's a really great hedge on, on inflation, which is something we're all worrying about right now. Visit getacregold.com slash Knowles. Start investing in physical gold today. Make sure you go to that URL because Acre is giving away a gold bar. To qualify for the giveaway, tweet or post why you should be the recipient and mention at get underscore Acre. That is getacregold.com slash Knowles. Thank you, Acre Gold, for supporting the show. Tough words from Joe Biden. Listen, Vlad. Listen, Vlad. Please, please only attack these 16. Oh, please do not attack these 16 things. I'm sorry. It's confusing because when you tell our adversary that these 16 things would be the absolute worst things to attack, please don't do it. What you are in effect telling him is these are the 16 things you should focus on attacking. The irony, of course, is that Donald Trump was tougher on Russia than any president since at least Ronald Reagan and maybe going back even further. There's no question about it. He was much tougher than Obama or Bush for that matter, or Clinton or Bush too. And I guess Reagan would, you know, Reagan did destroy the Soviet Union. So that would be the most recent one. But Trump was very, very tough. And what does Joe Biden do when he comes into office? He starts removing some of those those uh, sanctions, some of those attacks. He's, he's giving... Uh, Putin what he wants in uh, certain areas of commerce and oil. And now he's saying you can attack us and it won't, won't really matter. Don't, don't attack those 16 things. This is not just uh, showing you the U.S. and Russian relations under the different parties. It also shows you how the left negotiates. When they're negotiating on behalf of the country, they negotiate from weakness. And this is the phrase of Ronald Reagan, peace through strength. This is not a new concept, but the left is always, always arguing from a position of weakness uh, abroad when they're talking about the American nation. This was a bad trip overall for Joe Biden. 
It was a, he just was testy. He was tired. He was weak. Joe Biden actually was tougher on a CNN reporter, a CNN reporter who once a year, a CNN reporter asks a sort of almost fair question of the president, of, of the Democrat president. And he can't take that. They all have to be softballs. They all have to be, what kind of ice cream are you eating, Joe? The minute he gets a tough question, he snaps. He went tougher on her than he did on Putin. I'm not going to walk away on that. Why are you so confident he'll change his behavior, Mr. President? Yeah, I'm not confident he'll change his behavior. What, what do you do all the time? So, when did I say I was confident? You I said, said in the next six I months said, to be able to What I said was, let's get it straight. I said what will change their behavior is that the rest of the world reacts to them and it diminishes their standing in the world. I'm not confident of anything. I'm just stating the fact. But given his past behavior has not changed, and in that press conference after sitting down with you for several hours, he denied any involvement in cyber attacks, he downplayed human rights abuses, he even refused to say Alexei Navalny's name. So how does that account to a constructive meeting as president? You don't understand that you're in the wrong business. Is there something with China? Who we need to love? Who we need to love quickly? Let's go quickly. So this is as tough on a journalist as Donald Trump ever was. And yet, of course, the coverage is, you can actually see the coverage from, from some of the blue check journos on Twitter. They'll say, Donald Trump refused to answer a question and stormed away. This is an attack on our democracy. And then you see Joe Biden. Well, maybe she shouldn't have asked Joe Biden that question. And well, you know, maybe this and that. He, uh, Biden, I think, did actually have to apologize for this because he had no answer to the question. Uh, the, the question was a, a smart one and it was an important one. Uh, there's no reason to believe that Putin is going to make good on his promises. Joe Biden has no leverage here and his negotiation was brutal. It was awful. It was, it, it was weak. CNN, CNN has this one journalist, Caitlin Collins, who asks him a question. Joe Biden was not used to that because Joe Biden, as he has told us already, does not want to get unexpected questions. He gets a list from his people of the reporters that he is to call on. And when he loses his spot in the list, he actually holds up the press conference and says, hold on a second here. I've got to, I got to get out my paper to know which pre-screened journalists I'm allowed to talk to. I'll take your questions. And as usual, folks, they gave me a list of the people I'm going to call on. So, uh, Jonathan, Associated Press. That's, you're not supposed to say that part, Joe. <laughs> That's, you just have it on the sheet and then you pretend like you're, you're just calling on them, but you're not supposed to mention that they gave you the list. Who is they? They are the people who are actually running the country because it's quite clear at this point that Joe Biden is not. Do you feel comfortable with this guy negotiating on behalf of you and on behalf of your communities and your country? Of course not. But I suppose it doesn't really matter because Joe Biden is just a stand-in for the liberal blob and the liberal establishment. Now, CNN does not have the only journalists out there who very rarely, but on occasion, switch up the narrative. We saw this the other night with uh, no less a liberal than John Stewart. John Stewart went on Stephen Colbert's CBS show. These guys used to work together on Comedy Central at The Daily Show, The Colbert Report. Now they're coming and they actually disagreed. These are both dyed-in-the-wool liberals. They disagreed because Jon Stewart said, you know, it sure does look like the virus came from that lab in Wuhan. I think we owe a great debt of gratitude to science. Science has in many ways helped ease uh, the suffering of this pandemic, uh, which was more than likely caused by science. What do you mean by that? Do you mean like well, so this perhaps a, was, there's, there's a chance that this was created in a lab, there's an investigation? A chance? Well, but I, so, I, 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 oh my if God. there is evidence, I'd love to hear it. There's I don't a know. novel respiratory coronavirus overtaking Wuhan, China. What do we do? Oh, you know who we could ask? The Wuhan novel respiratory coronavirus lab. The disease... <laughs> is the same name as the lab. <laughs> so think about Stewart. Stewart actually is pretty funny, right? And he is a, I don't think he's a sophisticated political thinker, but he, he points out what we have all known for a year and a half. And this is where I want you to be very careful. Do not give John Stewart credit. Do not do it. This is an op. 
this is fake. Do not believe this. The, the purpose of this debate between Jon Stewart and Stephen Colbert and I'm not saying this is the purpose that was going on in Jon Stewart's mind or Stephen Colbert's mind. I'm saying this is the reason this is being blown up and being talked about right now, is to create the illusion that that parts of the media are reasonable on this, parts of the media are losing their using their common sense. Where was Jon Stewart a year and a half ago? Where was he? Where were the mainstream media a year and a half ago? He's right. Yeah. Oh, the novel coronavirus that was found in bats is uh, discovered right next to the novel coronavirus in bats laboratory in Wuhan. Oh, wow. What a coincidence. When we said that a year and a half ago, the John Stewart's of the world were either silent or were telling us that we were crazy coup conspiracists and big technology companies were censoring us and were fact checking us and were telling us that that was absolutely crazy and unscientific and we should be ostracized from society. And now they're saying, well, what? I mean, obviously we've got common sense. Obviously it had something to do with the lab. Yes, that's true. I'm glad that you agree with me, Johnny come lately, but it's so disingenuous because you had to cover it up a year and a half ago because it contradicted your political agenda and it would have put into greater peril, the 2020 election that you were trying to win. And it would have given Donald Trump credit for being obviously correct at the time that they all said, no, he's a racist. He's unscientific. He's a Ruby. He's an idiot. Trump got, I want to say 97 out of a hundred things right on the coronavirus. The mainstream media and the Dr. Fauci's and the democratic party got I was going to say three out of a hundred things right. I think it's zero out of a hundred things right on the coronavirus. And now they're going to try to come in and pretend that they were reasonable uh, on this as well. No, thank you. Sorry. It's not going to work. I'm glad that John Stewart is learning and he's coming back around and he's going to try to do better. That's fine. We'll, we'll give him grace to do that in the future. But a year and a half late ain't going to cut it. No, do not fall for this. They were entirely wrong on the virus. They have no credibility. They should not be believed on any part of it from now on. And you're going to hear a whole lot about not just the vaccines, the vaccine passports, the new, the new lockdowns for the new variants or whatever. Don't believe them. Don't believe them about any of it. If they hadn't squandered their credibility day in and day out by the, by the hour, by the minute for a year and a half, then maybe they, they could be believed. But as of now, they cannot. You got to be prepared for stuff, folks. Got to be prepared, which is why I strongly recommend you check out Trust and Will. At trustandwill.com, setting up an estate plan is simple, it's convenient, it's secure. For as little as $39, you can nominate guardians for your children, determine who gets your stuff, and plan for future medical care, all from the comfort of your home. Trust and Will documents are designed by estate planning experts and customized for the state you live in. With live customer support seven days a week, trustandwill.com's team is available to answer any questions you have while setting up your plan. Trust and Will is a trusted name in online estate planning, the category leader on Trustpilot, and they've helped hundreds of thousands of people protect their families, assets, and legacy. I have had a, a will since I was a very young man, since I was a teenager. That's very important to up, can make sure it's up to date, especially if you have a little kid, especially if you buy a house or something like that. Just get peace of mind. Seriously, get peace of mind right now at trustandwill.com slash Knowles. Get 10% off plus free shipping uh, of your customized legal documents. Don't wait. Go right now. Very, very important. 10% off plus free shipping at trustandwill.com slash Knowles, trustandwill.com slash Knowles. There will be no accountability from the mainstream media. They lie and they lie and they spread fake news. And that's always true. But I'm, <laughs> I'm talking about something much more egregious than fibbing about some politician or, or whatever. They were complicit in shutting down the country for a year and a half. And now they're going to change their tune that the fact of the matter is undeniable with regard to China's complicity, with regard to the Wuhan laboratory, with regard to the very likely human role in developing this virus. Now they're going to try to change their tune. Don't let them do it. There's never any accountability from these guys. On a, on a totally separate issue, I have to play you. I meant to play it for you a few days ago, but it's still quite relevant. Anna Navarro, who is a fake Republican. She's one of the Republicans one of the court jester conservatives who is hired by the leftist media to dance around and do a little soft shoe and put a jester hat on and pretend to be a Republican to give the illusion of debate. 
And her entire purpose is to prop up the ruling liberal regime. But if the ruling liberal regime only had liberals on the shows, only had open liberals on the shows, then it would seem like uh, North Korea or something. <laughs> it would seem like uh, Assad's Syria or, or Putin's Russia. It would seem like there's no dissent whatsoever. But if they put on some fake Republicans who, you know, they put on their Republican makeup and they do a little dance, then it at least gives the illusion of debate. So Anna Navarro is one of these people on, on The View on ABC. Anna Navarro came out defending another journalist, mainstream media star, who's not going to have any accountability, Jeffrey Tubin. Jeffrey Duman, who was caught, in the words of Woody Allen, having sex with someone he loves on a Zoom call on, for the New Yorker magazine. He's now being rehabilitated. There's no problem at all for, for Jeffrey Tubin. So he, he is coming back into the mainstream and he's, he's uh, you know, going to uh, be on CNN again. And Anna Navarro says, you know what? I think it's perfectly fine. You know, actually, I'm not surprised he's back on the air, but I will tell you when I saw that interview, oh God, how embarrassing, how humiliating. I, I kept thinking to myself, if I have to go on live TV and explain to the nation why I masturbated on a Zoom call, I think I'd rather go sell avocados under I-95 than get my job back on TV. Look, um, I think some instances of sexual harassment are black and white. Some instances are uh, more nuanced. In this case, uh, he was not sexually harassing anybody. He didn't have the intent to sexually harass somebody. He was sexually harassing himself, uh, maybe, okay? He was on a Zoom call. He w it was an accidental exposure. It was not a CNN Zoom call. It was with The New Yorker from where he has been terminated and faced consequences. Anna Navarro's commentary here is accidentally interesting. I don't think she knows why it's interesting, but it is for her. And don't forget, she's considered to be one of the conservative people <laughs> on The View. She isn't. She's a dyed-in-the-wool liberal. But for her, the only fault that one can, can engage in is the violation of consent. The only criterion that matters when we're making moral judgments for Anna Navarro is consent, right? It's the harassment. It's in, infringing on someone else's desires or feeling of comfort. And so he, Jeffrey Tubin did that. He just didn't know that he did that. He said it was a sort of accidental exposure an accidental sexual harassment. But to me, the sexual harassment was not really so much the issue. Like, yes, I mean, you, I, I'm sure people felt uncomfortable looking at that on Zoom, and that was, I'm sure, terribly unpleasant for them. But it was the behavior itself. It was shameful for him. Why, why is it shameful? Why is it shameful and, and embarrassing? And why would Anna Navarro rather go sell avocados underneath a bridge than have to show her face on television again if she got caught doing that? Because the act is shameful itself. To quote Norm MacDonald, Sex is a filthy, shameful thing that is obviously only meant for procreation. He put that, put that in one of his comedy albums. And Norm MacDonald one of the greatest political philosophers around. <laughs> Jeffrey Tubin did a thing that we just know intrinsically is shameful. And that brings us embarrassment. And that's why Anna Navarro would rather go sell the avocados underneath the bridge. But she doesn't understand that. We, we don't have the moral language to talk about private acts as though they can be right or wrong. But now on the left and even in part on the right, anything that you want to do so long as it is in private and doesn't hurt someone else in, in some obvious way is considered to be A-OK. -okay. That's a very degraded, shallow moral vision of, of politics. And it's why all of, even the people who are conservatives today actually seem a lot like liberals. You just think about this for, you ever hear, uh, hey, don't be a wanker. I guess it's said more in the United Kingdom than here. Hey, don't be, a, why? Why don't you want to do it? Because there's something shameful about that. And we can tr transform society and deconstruct and, you know, uh, contrive this and that, but it doesn't matter. That's always going to be the case. Speaking of guys looking at pictures of hot women and speaking of human nature not changing, Victoria's Secret is getting rid of the angels. Victoria's Secret is getting rid of all the hot chicks. And they're making a conscious decision to trade the hot chicks for Megan Rapino, that radical purple-haired lesbian soccer player. 
And they're going to do this as a major, massive marketing uh, turnaround to give women what they really want. So this is the headline, New York Times. Victoria's Secret swaps angels for what women want. Will they buy it? This shows you, speaking of self-love and self-obsession, this shows you how mistaken this modern ideology is. The embattled lingerie giant is attempting the most extreme brand turnaround in recent memory in effort to redefine not just itself, but also the very idea of what sexy is. So, so what? I'm trying to be like polite about this. Victoria's Secret is now going to say that, what was that woman's name? Tara Banks. You know, she was like extremely attractive. Or all of the Victoria's Secret angels, they are no longer, they're going to redefine sexy. So they are no longer sexy. Sexy is Megan Rapino. Sexy is people who are not sexy. I, I don't, that's, that's, the, that's the argument even that the New York Times is making. Okay. This is, I guess, just one of the most ridiculous examples of how the left tries to redefine the words in order to redefine reality. You might say they try to control words to control minds, which is the subject of my upcoming book, Speechless, available now for pre just in case. I didn't know if the bell was going to come in on time. Just in case. You can get that right now. The uh, Speechless, I think, is only, oh my gosh, oh my, it's only available for pre-order for another five days, folks. You can get a signed first edition copy from Premier Collectibles for five more days. Then it will no longer be on pre-order. It will be on order, but it will not be on pre-order anymore. So go get Speechless today. You can go to, you can go to, you can go to speechlessbook.com. I'm going to double up on the Pavlovian responses. So that, that's their plan. They're going to, at Victoria's Secret, get rid of the hot angels and put in these people who are not, not attractive. They say this is what women want. Why do women buy Victoria's Secret? Do they buy Victoria's Secret just for themselves? No, they buy Victoria's Secret for me and for you, other guy listening to this show, and for you, guy listening to this show in your car. They buy Victoria's Secret to make themselves attractive to men. There may be some other reasons. Maybe it feels more comfortable in certain ways, but really that's not it. The purpose of Victoria's Secret is to be sexy, right? That's what New York Times is telling you. They're redefining what sexy is. It's to be sexy. Who are they sexy for? They're sexy for men. I know that today we're supposed to pretend that 90% of the population are like trans, bi, non-binary, lesbian, whatever. but that's just not true. The overwhelming majority of people, 97% or so, are basically ordinary in their sexual views. They're and, for the vast, vast, vast majority of women, they're trying to attract men and men are not attracted. How do I, I don't want to be rude to anybody. Men are attracted to people who are sexy. And what is sexy is to, to a very small degree, socially constructed and to the much larger degree, natural. It comes from our loins. It comes from our DNA. It comes from our caveman brain and no amount of social engineering is going to change that. This Victoria's Secret story is the whole story of progressive politics. They, the progressive looks at the world and says, I hate this world. I hate the way society is. I hate the way we live. I hate nature itself. And I'm just going to change it. And I can change that through my unfettered reason and through my tyranny of will in politics, which can turn the world into anything that I want it to be. Ye shall be as gods. As the serpent tells Eve in the Garden of Eden, as Whitaker Chambers, the ex-communist, describes communism as saying, it's, it's the serpent in the garden. You shall be as gods, but you shan't be. You really will not be. You can't totally change the world. The experiments in politics fail, and I strongly suspect the experiment from Victoria's Secret is going to fail too. You know, there are great books to pre-order these days. Notably, Speechless, Controlling Words, Controlling Minds. It's hard to get the three at once. Uh, 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 the second best book you can pre-order right now, The Authoritarian Moment by Ben Shapiro. It's available for pre-order at Amazon, Barnes & Noble, or any other major bookseller, and it will be my campaign slogan someday. If you go to the Amazon Prime video page, by the way, you'll find an entire section dedicated to black voices. Black, this is the most, imp- there's black voices from Black History Month or Black Lives Matter Month, or I don't know. Now, once upon a time, you were also able to find Created Equal, 
Clarence Thomas's documentary that details his rise from the segregated South to the highest court in the land and the all-out war that was waged on him by the left during his confirmation process, which, by the way, is an episode that I talk about in my upcoming book, Speechless, Controlling Words, Controlling Minds. However, even though Clarence Thomas is one of the most important black voices in the country, the documentary just mysteriously disappeared from Amazon's queue during none other than that sacred Black History Month. It's not, you can't get it anywhere. Well, that's so strange. Take a quick look at the trailer. I was never going to be white. The problem is I can never go back completely to the world I came from. I saw what I had become. I didn't ask God that if you take anger out of my heart, I'll never hate again. You're not really black because you're not doing what we expect black people to do. That's when all heck broke loose. So you'd still like to serve on the Supreme Court? I'd rather die than withdraw from the process. Man, Clarence Thomas, just just love that guy. So you can stream Created Equal tomorrow, live at 9 p.m. Eastern, 8 p.m. Central, not on those big tech platforms, at dailywire.com. If you're not yet a Daily Wire member, join with code JUSTICE for 20% off your membership and get this Clarence Thomas documentary and all our other great content, like our talk show, Candace, our first film, Run, Hide, Fight, and whole lots of other stuff on demand. We'll be right back with a lot more. Victoria's Secret is trading in the Angels for Megan Rapino. You know, so they're trading in people traditionally considered to be sexy for, according to the New York Times, people who are not. They are doing that because the very idea of making oneself desirable to another person is now considered wrong, unjust, and bigoted. You've seen a lot of TikToks going around TikTok. I guess I actually, I'm not on TikTok because I don't want to give Xi Jinping all of my data, but you do see these videos going around YouTube or going around Twitter from TikTok. And a woman explained the even, even murkier, more bigoted origins, origins of fat phobia. It doesn't just come from anti-fatness. It also comes from racism. Here's your reminder that fat phobia is rooted in racism. As always, if you haven't read this book, go do that. The main thing to understand is that for the last 300-ish years, white folks have been marketing fatness as a black trait. And this is regardless of whether or not black people individually were actually fat. That was irrelevant. The message they spread was that black women specifically were ravenous and uncontrollable, and these barbaric traits made them fat. On the flip side, thinness was marketed as a white trait. Again, regardless of whether or not individual white people were actually thin, that was irrelevant. The idea was that white women specifically were refined and restrained, and this led them to having delicate, thin bodies. Over the years, these messages have become more subtle, but even today, they are still very prevalent in conversations around race, health, capitalism, and poverty. So, so fat phobia is the, well, I guess literally it would mean the irrational fear of fat people, but that's not what we're talking about here. When she means fat phobia, she means having a preference specifically a sexual preference for people that you find more attractive than other people. And if you have that, if you have a, just a natural attraction, that's bigoted, that's racist. And she's saying that fat phobia, the, by which she means just being attracted to people you're attracted to, that is rooted in racism because terrible white people, all those white people marketed the idea that black women were fat, regardless of the individual black women. Now, do you notice the logical error there? She's saying it's terrible to generalize about black women, which is what all the all those white people did. Well, hold, aren't you generalizing about the white people? You're you're willing to get specific and individual about the black people, but not about the white people because there's a complete double standard. Because th- this argument is incoherent, but it's it's just designed to get at a, a deep racial animus. And she says this is was awful. Let's assume that her premise is true that in popular culture, black women were considered to be, on average, more likely to be fat. That's just true. That's, that's true. that's actually one of the reasons that the coronavirus was tougher in black communities than it, than it was in white communities, is because in certain black communities, they were more likely to be obese, and obesity was a comorbidity. O- obesity was, was considered to be a factor that would put you at greater risk. So yeah, that, 
That's true. You're denying now statistics, the right facts that we can see from the CDC and from, from other agencies. Is that it's a hate fact? You're not allowed to acknowledge that? No, because if you acknowledge that fact, then you're perpetuating inequality. Well, it wouldn't it be better then to just like try to solve the problem? Well, no, if you try to solve the problem and deal with these health issues in the black community, which we have been told is, is very important, part of inequality is that there are worse health outcomes in the black community. Okay, well then perhaps we should tell people who are obese to lose weight. Well, you can't do that because that's fat phobic. Well, then what on earth are we supposed to do? You're supposed to feel bad about yourself and you're supposed to deny your attractions and you're supposed to hate your self and your ancestry and you're supposed to upend nature. Oh, is that all? Okay, that's fine. That's what, that's ultimately what it comes down to. There can be no solution to this. There can be no victory. Everything is about racism and racism can never be solved. And when some racial issues seem more important than others, we always have to redirect as the attorney general Merrick Garland just did and explain away every problem in society by white supremacy. The number of open FBI domestic terrorism investigations this year has increased significantly. According to an unclassified summary of the March intelligence assessment, the two most lethal elements of the domestic violence extremist threat are racially or ethnically motivated violent extremists and militia violent extremists. In the FBI's view, the top domestic violent extremist threat comes from racially or ethnically motivated violent extremists, specifically those who advocated for the superiority of the white race. According to the FBI, the biggest threat in the country is white supremacists. And that is just obviously ridiculous. <laughs> it's just, oh my gosh. Name the last organized white supremacy. He's talking about militias and all these organizations. Name the last organized white supremacist terror attack. And you name it. What, what you're going to name, if we're trying to be as fair as possible to these people, like Merrick Garland, is you're going to say the Capitol riot. Okay. Who, who did the racist white supremacist? I, I didn't see very many of them, but let's, let's say that that's, let's, con, let's conflate everything. Let's say that every Trump supporter is an evil, vicious, white supremacist, neo-Nazi. Obviously not true, but let's say it. Who did that, that group of people kill at the Capitol riot? Officer Brian Sicknick. Nope, that's not true. Even the New York Times had to admit that was a lie. Uh, some other, nope, nope, nobody, nobody. The only person who was killed in the violence of that day was one of the Trump supporters, Ashley Babbitt, killed by, ostensibly by a Capitol Hill police officer, but they're all really mum about it. No one is, is talking about it. No, no transparency whatsoever. Okay, now what about in the summer of 2020? When, when was the last black racially motivated mob uh, tearing up major cities? Oh, for all of 2020, right? The, the organization was called Black Lives Matter. It wasn't exclusively black people. There were, there were also some Antifa people there as well that would smash in windows. But that obviously was a, a racial movement. It was not a, not a white supremacist movement. And they burned down Minneapolis, burned down Los Angeles, burned down Washington, D.C., burned down San Francisco, burned on and on, burned down Chicago, on and on and on. And Merrick Garland stands up there with a straight face and says, well, the really, the big threat is white supremacy. How many, how many people are members of the Ku Klux Klan anymore? I, I suspect virtually every card carrying member of the Ku Klux Klan is just an FBI informant. Right? They're all, it's just the FBI sort of spying on other people working for the FBI. But, but it's white supremacy. It's the biggest problem in the whole wide world. And so we need to pass a new holiday specifically to recognize the evils, the white supremacist evils of this country and how we've overcome them. And that holiday is Juneteenth. Juneteenth, the most sacred day. We talked about it a little yesterday, but there's a new event. So the Senate passed it a couple days ago. Then the House passed it yesterday. It's going to the president's desk. Everyone is in support of Juneteenth. Everybody. It was unanimous in the Senate 
There were a handful of Republicans in the House who opposed it. Virtually every conservative commentator is, is trying to come out on the side of this being a really good idea because they don't want to be called racists. I'm going to level with you. I'm just going to shoot straight. It's a bad idea. Juneteenth should not be a federal holiday. It shouldn't. It's, it's, ba- it's purely a leftist contrivance as it currently stands. And no Republican should go along with it. There were 10 federal holidays each year. Do you know what those federal holidays are? New Year's Day, Independence Day, Thanksgiving Day, Christmas Day, Washington's birthday, Memorial Day, Labor Day, Veterans Day, Columbus Day, love that one, and the birthday of Martin Luther King Jr. This holiday, this 11th annual holiday, Juneteenth, seems categorically different to me than these other holidays. And I was trying to put my finger on it. I said, what is it? What is it about Juneteenth that is different than these other holidays? And I realized all of these other holidays involve gratitude. They're essentially about gratitude. Thanksgiving, obviously, you give thanks to God. Christmas Day, obviously, you give thanks to God. Independence Day, even, you give thanks to God. Uh, John Adams said this, that the day should be filled with pious devotions to, to God for delivering us and giving us our freedom, our independence. Even New Year's Day. New Year's Day, you give thanks to one another for old Lang Syne. Uh, Washington's birthday, Columbus Day, and Martin Luther King Jr. Day are to give thanks to these great men who have uh, accomplished great things in the country. Memorial Day actually was begun as a Civil War holiday after Lincoln was assassinated to, to memorialize the Civil War dead who gave their lives for the very purpose of freeing the slaves. Labor Day to give uh, thanks to the ordinary Americans who keep the country going. Veterans Day, obviously, to give thanks to the veterans. What does Juneteenth give thanks for? It's not Emancipation Proclamation Day, right? That would, that would be a, just a Lincoln Day, basically. Thanks, Lincoln, for freeing the slaves. It's not 13th Amendment Ratification Day. Thanks, legislators, for outlawing slavery in the country. It, Juneteenth is just this day when a Union general makes it to Galveston, Texas, and tells people that the slaves had been freed three years prior by Abraham Lincoln. It's, it's just a local celebration in Galveston until a few years ago when uh, political activists decided to try to make it the most sacred day on the calendar. But why, why Juneteenth? I suspect the reason that they prefer Juneteenth to say Emancipation Proclamation Day is because it is now very unfashionable on the left to give credit to Abraham Lincoln for freeing the slaves. There was a piece came out in the Atlantic Magazine, one of the editors there, a few years ago, some years ago, more than that inveighing against a bunch of movies, 12 Years a Slave, a number of other movies, and including Lincoln, for perpetuating what they called white savior narratives. They said, this is awful. You can't, we should not have movies where white people do good things to black people or for black people. We can't do that. So what, Lincoln? <laughs> Link, Abraham Lincoln, the white savior who freed the slaves? He's not, you can't have a white savior narrative in that movie? No, he didn't free the slaves. They freed themselves. That's not true, but that's what they're saying. Just the other day, you saw this this NPR TV critic attacking Tom Hanks and saying that Tom Hanks has spent much of his career in his historical movies portraying white people, white men doing the right thing. And that's unacceptable. White men cannot do the right thing. So I suspect the reason that it's not Emancipation Proclamation Day is because that would have to give credit to Abraham Lincoln, a white guy. And you can't, you can't do that. I, I suspect the reason it's not 13th Amendment ratification days, you'd have to give credit to a lot of white guys. Can't, you're not allowed to do that. That would be a white savior narrative. I suspect that the reason that Juneteenth has been selected is because it's just this kind of inconclusive moment on the way in between the Emancipation Proclamation and the 13th Amendment that is just kind of giving some news, but it's unfinished. It's not a holiday about gratitude. It's about resentment. You don't need to take my word for it. This is, the, this is what Rashida Tlaib said during the debate. This national holiday will serve as a powerful reminder that we cannot run from our past. Not thank you for freeing the slaves. No, no, it's we cannot run from our vicious past. Uh, uh, who's this other woman? Brenda Lawrence, Democrat, says during the debate, it's also a recognition that we have so much work to do to rid this country of systemic racism, discrimination, and hate. So much work to do. Not something was accomplished. That would be Emancipation Proclamation Day or 13th Amendment Day would be something was accomplished. Let's give thanks for that. This is, no, 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 it wasn't accomplished. So much work to do. And then Obama, I think, proved it last year when he tweeted out, Juneteenth has never been a celebration of victory. 
or an acceptance of the way things are. It's a celebration of progress. It's an affirmation that despite the most painful parts of our history, change is possible and there is still so much work to do. This is it. This is the perpetual revolution that can never end. There's always so much work. Nothing to be grateful for. The past always evil. The future always better. We need to overcome the evil past to get into the glorious future. It's a progressive holiday. It is the holiday of progressivism. And by the way, it's not, the bill is not just called the Juneteenth bill. It's called the Juneteenth National Independence Day bill. It is a reframing of our very Independence Day away from July 4th, 1776. That was a bad day when bad, evil white men cynically pretended to be calling for independence, but really they weren't. They were just propertied white men, you know, grounding our country, founding it in, in racism and bigotry. That's the 1619 project says this. The, it's uh, historically illiterate, but what she's saying is that the America was founded to protect slavery. Completely untrue, but that's, that's the argument to reframe American history. This holiday is about reframing American history. It's about reframing our independence day. It's too bad the Republicans went along with it. Most Republicans went along with it. Now there is someone out there who wants to break the mold and run for president. I'm not talking about the Republicans. Not, not talking about Ron DeSantis, who's obviously running for president. I'm not talking about some Democrat, Kamala Harris, who may already be the president. We're not sure. I'm talking about a centrist who's voted for both Republicans and Democrats. I'm talking about a man that 46% of Americans, according to some probably bogus poll, want to run for president. I'm talking about Dwayne The Rock Johnson. Do you smell how The Rock is campaigning? I do. Dwayne The Rock Johnson uh, was just giving an interview to People Magazine. He was referring to this poll that 46% of Americans want him to run for president. He said it's a humbling honor and that he would consider it. He said he's going to go on a listening tour and figure out if people really want him to run. And this is his argument. I love our country to my core and I'm endlessly grateful for the opportunities I've had here as a half black, half Samoan kid being able to work my ass off knowing tenacity opens doors. In a lot of ways, I'm indebted to our great country for it. I am not eager for the rock presidency. Okay. I'm not eager for the rock candidacy. I don't like that he endorsed uh, uh, Joe Biden and Kamala Harris this last time. I don't think he knows a damn thing about politics. I strongly suspect he would not be a very good president. However, I would take him any day, even uh, this guy who I don't think he knows very much about politics. I would take him any day over Joe Biden. I would take him any day over, I guess, anyone in the Democratic Party for, for this one reason. For, by the way, The Rock's policies may be further left than some of these people. We just don't know, right? He's just an entertainer. But The Rock seems to like our country. <laughs> isn't that a novel thing? <laughs> isn't, it used to be that both parties loved our country, waved the flag, but we had disagreements about certain issues. Today, we are told by Joe Biden, by the current president, who's a thousand years old, who's as establishment as they get, he says this country was founded on the original sin of white supremacy. We've got to overcome our past. It's the same stuff you hear from Obama. It's the same stuff you hear in the, in the Juneteenth bill arguments, that the country is a terrible place and we've got to overcome it. And Dwayne The Rock Johnson is giving, saying something that's so simple, but it's, it's so nice that he's grateful to the country, that it's a good place. He loves his country. You should love your country. Love of country is an extension of your, love of your parents. It's an extension of filial piety. Even if you've got problems with your country, you should still have a love of your country. This is why this, you know, sometimes you hear this dichotomy. My country right or wrong, my country only when right. It, this is not even a prescriptive question. It's just a descriptive one. Your country is your country when it's right or wrong. And you need to stand by your country and you need to have courage and you need to try to fix the things that ought to be fixed. Of course. And Dwayne The Rock Johnson, at least at this very base level, very base level if you ask me, understands this kind of gratitude. We are not going to have a country very long though if we don't get certain things under control, namely immigration. What do we have? Something like three, no, I'm sorry, 6,000 people pouring across our border every single day now. This is untenable. The left loves it because it's giving them future voters statistically overwhelmingly likely to vote for Democrats either once they get amnesty or down the road. So Greg Abbott, he's saying Joe Biden's not going to give us any money for the wall. 
He's actually halted construction of the wall. So you know what? We're going to build it ourselves. In a letter, Greg Abbott directed the executive director of the Texas Department of Criminal Justice to transfer a quarter billion dollars in general revenue to the disaster fund within this trusted programs, uh, within the office of the governor. This will be a down payment to begin design and construction of the wall with Mexico. Really good stuff. Because Greg Abbott, he's obviously throwing red meat out to the conservatives and he's saying, we're going to build the wall ourselves. But that and a buck fifty will get you a cup of coffee if you don't actually have the fund. So he's transferring a quarter billion dollars to build it. That's good stuff. Ron DeSantis, not to be outdone, governor of Florida, is saying that he is going to send Florida law enforcement personnel to Texas to protect the border. Today, we're here to announce that the state of Florida is answering the call. Florida is going to support Texas and Arizona. Uh, We believe that securing the southern border is important for our country, but specifically we believe it will benefit the people of Florida uh, to be able to get this under control. And so where the federal government has failed, the states are stepping up uh, and doing our best to fill the void. Wow. This is pretty big stuff. This is pretty big stuff. He is saying we're going to send Florida law enforcement to another state. I, as the governor of Florida, am going to send my law enforcement to another state to deal with the border. This is a very ambitious play. It's a very dangerous play. If any Florida law enforcement officer is killed or frankly even injured down there at the border, DeSantis is going to have big trouble. He's going to be accused of derelicting his duty, of compromising his responsibility to Floridians, to, because of his national ambitions. They're going to be saying there's no reason you should have been sending those guys over to the Texas border. Now, the way he could defend it is to say, look, we are a country. All right, we are individual states, but we are a country together. And the problem of illegal immigration is a problem that's going to affect Floridians too. It's going to affect our whole country. Even if not one single illegal alien came to Florida, the political issues caused by this will affect Florida. We are not just islands floating off by ourselves. We are together in a country. So it's, it's an important matter for Florida to, to deal with this. It's a little bit of a tenuous argument, but he could do it. The fact is, if and when he runs for president, this is going to be a good line. He's going to be able to say, look, I broke the mold. I stood up in a way I took on national issues. He's going to have a record on one of the most important issues in the Republican Party. This guy is running very, very seriously for president. president. This guy is obviously very sharp. He, he sees what he's doing and he, he is identifying, forget DeSantis for a second, he's identifying this immigration issue, this issue of national identity, this issue of, of who we are and what kind of political control we are even allowed to have. The, the bureaucracy and the liberal establishment says we can't even control who comes into the country. And he's saying, yes, we can. He is betting that that is going to be issue, the issue that motivates Republicans. The left is betting that racial division is going to be the issue that motivates Democrats. And you're going to, I think both of them are right. I think you're going to see that duked out. What's the real threat? Where is the real America? What is, what is the sort of issue that lies at the heart, the real heart of Americans? That's the question for the next three years. I'm Michael Knowles. This is The Michael Knowles Show. See you tomorrow. The Michael Knowles Show is produced by Ben Davies. Executive producer, Jeremy Boring. Our technical director is Austin Stevens. Supervising producers, Mathis Glover and Robert Sterling. Production manager, Pavel Vidovsky. Editor and associate producer, Danny D'Amico. Audio mixer, Mike Coromina. Hair and makeup by Nika Geneva. And production coordinator, McKenna Waters. The Michael Knowles Show is a Daily Wire production. Copyright Daily Wire 2021. Today on the Ben Shapiro Show, President Biden has his showdown with Vladimir Putin, and it doesn't go great. The Federal Reserve dramatically increases its inflation estimate, and the left celebrates Juneteenth becoming a national holiday by calling America racist. That's today on the Ben Shapiro Show. Give it a listen. Listen.